Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. God bless you for being here. As you know, this is His time, His day, and we've come together to praise Him. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. I invite you, anybody that would like to join me at the altar, come and let's kneel together at the altar. If you'll bow your head, let's, let me just direct your prayer just a little bit as, with every head bowed and every eye closed. First of all, we would be remiss not to pray for those folks who were impacted by the storms. Some of them lost everything. <clears throat> now, if you will, be very specific in praying for this service. Ask God to come and speak a word to us that would help us through our struggles, our storms, our daily lives. Jesus, Father, Savior, we gather as your people thanking you for so many things. Thanking you that you love us. Thanking you that you care for us. Thanking you that you watch over us and you want the best for us. I pray for every person in this building. I pray that, Lord, that this will be the day that you speak to us. That this will be the, day, the time that you show us yourself so that we can see ourselves in light of you. As we sing, I pray that, that you will initiate the song from the bottom of our hearts. That as we worship you, that our adoration and our praise, our thoughts will all be on you. And at the end of the, our time together, I pray that you would do a work in our lives. A work that only you can do because you are our Savior and Lord. Sing that chorus with me. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Let's stand. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your... Let's sing that again together. Jesus, Lamb of God. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Amen. Remain standing as we sing together. <clears throat> Let's sing, Isn't the Name Wonderful? Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? All the world can come to Him to have their sins removed. Isn't the name of Jesus wonderful? Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? 
Son of God in one of us, lover of our souls. Isn't the name of Jesus beautiful? Eternal King, you will reign forever, and we will sing the glory of your name. Be lifted high for all the world to see, your name is all they need, your name is all we need. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Chains are broken when it's spoken. Every knee must bow. Isn't the name of Jesus powerful? Eternal King. Eternal King. the name of Jesus all we need isn't the name of Jesus all we need he's the way the truth the life the only way to God isn't the name of Jesus all we need And he's the way, the truth, the life, the only way to God. Isn't the name of Jesus all we need? Brother Kevin. Lord, we come to you this morning thanking you for loving us. Thank you for being wonderful. Lord, now as we are here, we thank you for the freedom that we enjoy to be able to gather and worship. And I pray that as we are here this morning, that uh, we would be open to your spirit, open to the truth of your word, and just let us open our hearts and minds to worship you this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Let's sing together. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in... Let's sing that again. Surely the presence. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. 
What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are stilled, when striving cease My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand In Christ alone, who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless babe This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on that cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory sin's curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final prayer, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man could ever plug me from his hand till he remains or call me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand Lord we want to know you, live our lives to show you all the love we owe you. We're seekers of your heart. Sometimes we get caught up in the words that we sing and we really don't read them. Did you read those words as you sang the previous song? No fear in, in the light, no fear in death because Jesus is our answer. Today we continue reading from Paul's book, to, Paul's letter to the Romans. One of the most powerful passages in the New Testament. Would you read it with me please? For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Romans 1, 16, 17. And by the way, that, that's preceded by, by Paul saying, I'm, not, I'm, obligated. I'm obligated to this task of bringing the gospel to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Let's stand together and read it together as unto the Lord. Would you do that with me? For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and also to the Greek. 
For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Romans 1, 16. Remain standing, let's sing together.
Well, a few of you do. I know I, when, I, when I take this crowd by surprise, we don't respond. What a sacrifice that saved my life. It's the blood of Jesus. Could I get an amen? Amen, amen yeah. If you will, take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 14. See the title of the message on your screen in your bulletin. We're going to take a little break from our, Rome, our Revelation study. We got Easter coming up two weeks, uh, Palm Sunday next week, and then a couple weeks later we have graduate recognition, Mother's Day. So we're just going to take a little pause, a little breath, because I think there's some things that God wants to speak into us as individuals and collectively as a church. Uh, today, Matthew 14 is going to be a very familiar story. It's going to be almost an object lesson, and you're going to think, Brother Jerry mistitled this until, if you don't stay with us till the end, because the truth is there's so many things. I can take this scripture and, and, and preach and share so many things, but we're going to um, kind of zero in today. So if you will, if you found Matthew chapter 14, let's stand together. And let's get our scripture in front of us, if you can and will. We pick up at verse 4. 14, immediately, he, that's Jesus, immediately, he made his, the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After dismissing the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Well into the night, many translations say the fourth watch. He was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat was already some distance from land, battered by the winds because the wind was against them. Jesus came toward them walking on the sea very early in the morning. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them. Have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter answered him, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. And climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he, that's Peter, saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshipped him and said, Truly, you are the Son of God. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I pray that in the minutes that are ahead that you will open our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our ears. Open that part of us that hadn't been opened in a while so that you can speak to us. That you can remind us that no matter what comes our way that you're right there with us. And all we have to do is call on your name. Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, may today be the day that they receive you as their personal Savior. Lord Jesus, I pray if someone doesn't recognize you as the son of the living God, I pray that today that will change. Speak to us. Remove me. And give us your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. This is a message about Jesus. It's not a message about Peter walking on the water, although it's a part of it. It's not a message about the disciples. It's about Jesus about what Jesus does. But I just want to, we picked up kind of in the middle of the story 
Just for clarification, if you were to read the previous part of these verses, what you discover is the disciples had just assisted Jesus in feeding 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. We hear that and it just kind of goes over our head until we have to feed 500 people out here with 30 people bringing food. Hello? I want some perspective here. They had a monumental task of Jesus breaking the bread for 5,000 people. Them distributing the food for 5,000 people. For them collecting 12 baskets. 5,000 people. Can you say exhausted? (laughs) That's what I'm talking about. By the way, a little child shall lead them, okay? Great job. They were exhausted. Jesus was physically exhausted, and so what he wanted to do was recharge his batteries. So he dismissed, not particularly in this order, he dismissed the crowd and sent them away. And then he dismissed the disciples because he wanted some time, what you would call a long time. But he didn't really want a long time. He wanted time with the Father. He wanted to recharge his spiritual batteries. He wanted to get back in touch with the Father. And so he sent the disciples. I'm going to say this a number of times. He made the disciples. He compelled the disciples. He constrained the disciples. He commanded the disciples to get in the boat and go. Here's the deal. The disciples were right where Jesus sent them, doing exactly what Jesus told them to do, headed right where Jesus uh, wanted them to go, and they ran into a storm. Just to be clear, Jesus put them in the boat and told them to go. Can you remember the three words? If you can, say it out loud. The other side. He told them to go to the other side. Now, I just want to pause. Can you put a parenthesis here? Let me just give you a little word. Might come another time. That concept of the other side is big in the Gospels and with Jesus. If you do a search, you'll discover that three, at least a dozen times the other side is mentioned. You see, Jesus always had his eye out there on the future, on the other side. Why was it the other side? Because if you read verses uh, 34 through 36, you'll discover that there was ministry to be done. There were lives to be touched. There were hearts to be changed. Miracles to be performed. Jesus never traveled over 100 miles from home, but listen, he never turned his eyes backwards. His eyes were always on the other side about what ministry was lay ahead. Who was yet to be touched? Who was yet to be reached? Experiences yet to be had. He always had a high for the future and the possibilities. Parenthesis closed. Let's get back to the disciples. The disciples were in the center of God's will, right where Jesus had sent them. And they found themselves in the middle of a storm. The Christian Standard Version, which I read, says the wind was against them. This is one of those few times in my life, all translations are not equal, but all, many translations are good. But this is one of those times in my life, Eric, when I really like what the King James Version says. It says the wind was contrary. Contrary. Now you're smiling. You haven't heard the term in a while. But it's a good term. Now, I know what it is to have things and people against me. But I have a first-hand knowledge of what it is to be contrary and to deal with contrary. And you go, Brother Jerry, how do you know that? I have two children. And my children taught me about being contrary. In fact, yesterday as I was telling Christy I was going to use this, she said, well, Dad, not until I got to be a teenager. And some of you are going, okay, what did they do that was so contrary? 
And I'm not going to tell you, I will not divulge that, what they did to be contrary, because both of our children, thanks be to God, seem to be really good adults today. Could I get an amen? amen. With contrary kids of their own. We have one child that was diagnosed with oppositional disorder. So we know about contrary. This wind was contrary. It, they were trying to go across. It should have been an easy job. It was, it's four miles. It's very familiar uh, body of water. They should go across. And they've been working for hours. If they left before dark, they've been working now probably for eight or nine hours in this wind and are probably no more than halfway across. The truth is, is that when you look at those disciples on that ship, you had at least four professional fishermen on the trip. And they were out in the middle of the sea, right where God put them, and they're in a mess. Let's leave them on the sea for a second. Let's talk about you. Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt like you were doing exactly what God called you to do? You were in exactly the place that God wanted you to be. You were saying and you were living as best as you knew. You were doing exactly right. And life kind of went upside down. <laughs> a storm came. Did you find yourself going, well, did I miss God? Did I misunderstand? Why is this happening to me? That struggle. You know, to read God's word is to understand that we as pampered Americans have trouble with this truth. The theology of the land of the free seems to be, if I follow God, life will be easy. I mean, if I, if I have problems, and I do, if I get sick, and I will, if something goes bad, and it shall, God's got my back, and all I got to do is pray to my divine servant, and with a touch of his hand, he'll supernaturally fix it. And you know, we, we would like it to be that way. Young people, it's not that way. We would like it to be that way. And you go, well, yeah, it is. I, I, Brother Jerry, that's my theology. Well, that's fine. Have your theology. But let me just tell you something. It wasn't that way for Job. It wasn't that way for Daniel. It wasn't that way for David. It wasn't that way for Peter. It wasn't that way for Paul. It wasn't by, that way for anybody else in the, in the Bible. The truth is, is that it seems that God allows storms, struggles into our lives, into the lives of his people for the purpose of testing us, testing our commitment to him, testing our maturing love for him. It's been said that a love that can't be tested can't be trusted. Our tendency is to see life through our own eyes, our human eyes. But Paul tells us that to see what we see now is we see through a glass darkly. It's not clear. I thought about how to illustrate this so everybody understands. I love to take a hot shower. Could I get a witness? Amen. I love to take, and, and furthermore, I love to close the door when I take a hot shower. Because when I get out of the shower, you know what's going on. It's misty and it's foggy. But you know what it does to the mirror? Fogs it up. And so you get out of the bath, you get out of the shower, and you go and you take a towel and you want to clear it. I'm not going to shave. I mean, it might look like I do, but I'm not going to shave in a foggy mirror. Ladies, you're not going to put on your makeup in a foggy mirror. Hello? You're going to clean it. Well, here's what he's telling us. He's telling us when we see things in this world today through our human eyes, we are seeing in that unclear Mirror in that unclear way. The truth is, the truth is, is that I want us to see this story today through the eyes of Jesus and what Jesus does. 
so that you and I will walk out of here today knowing that through it all, Jesus will be there. Let me just give you four things that I see that Jesus does. He does it in the storm. He does it before the storm. He does it after the storm. First thing is, Jesus calls. Jesus has many callings he, he puts on us. He calls us to be saved. Calls us to salvation. As, as, as those songs so beautifully said, it's only the blood of Jesus that washes our soul. We can't do it on our own. In fact, if we, if we try to do it on our own, we're going to wind up in a place we don't want to try if we try some other Jesus besides Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He was here before time began. He'll be after, here after time is over. That's the biblical Jesus. When we come to Jesus, he forgives our sin because he died for him and he gives us a new life and we'll be raised to sit with him in heavenly places because of who he is. Jesus calls you to be saved today. And, there, and if you don't trust Jesus with your life, if you don't trust Jesus with your life, there's no hope for you when you close your eyes from this life. Jesus doesn't give the, the invitation, come to me and pray a prayer and get baptized and join the church. You know what his invitation is? You know what that call to salvation is? Follow me. Jesus calls. He calls us to salvation. He calls us to sanctification. That means clean up our life. Any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Watch this. Old things are passed away. He wants to reform your life. He wants, there's some things you're going to have to put away. There's some things you'll have to put down. There's some things you'll have to put to death. To follow him. He calls us to salvation. He calls us to sanctification. And then, old Baptist preacher, you don't even really have to say this, but I'm going to. He calls us to service. Everybody in this room that has trusted Christ Jesus, you have a mission, a ministry that he has called you to. You either say yes or no. Some of us in here need to get on board we have a mission trip going to Kentucky in just a few months. You need to be on board with that. You've never been to anything like that. You've never ministered like that. And this would be your time. It's not going to break the bank at $150. And if you don't have $150 and want to go, you come see me. We'll get it covered. It could change your life. He calls us to salvation. He calls us to sanctification, to clean up our lives. He calls us to service. Jesus calls us. When I look in this scripture, I see that he... Immediately, verse 24, he made the disciples. He made the disciples get in the boat. Other translations use words like compel or constrained. He sent them to the other side. I've already mentioned that for, for a minute. The rest of the story is that when they got over, when they got over to Gennesaret, Place recognized him and they brought people to him. And you see, they not only brought people to him, they alerted other people that he was there. Do you know what's being discovered in America today? Amidst all the moral melee, people are hungering and thirsting for spiritual truth. They are so tired of being yanked around. And yet, too often in our, in our haste for comfort and for convenience and other things, we tend to pass up this life that is the life in Jesus. People in our culture live in a perpetual storm in this room. Everybody is in one of three places. You're just coming out of a storm. Nobody may have known it, but you knew it. You're just coming out of a storm. You're in the middle of a storm. Or you're about to go into a storm. And truthfully, most of the time, these storms take us by surprise. And yet Jesus offers an answer. He calls us. Let's just let's follow that just for a second. In this room, we probably have a couple of hundred people, close to a couple of hundred, 150 to 200 people. I want you to just consider this. How many people 
this group will encounter this next week. Every person here will encounter a couple of dozen people. So if we say a hundred and a half, there'll be a couple of thousand people that we'll encounter this next week. Of those couple of thousand people, wonder how many are in a storm. Wonder how many of them are just hanging on by their fingertips. I mean, it could be a a family storm. It could be a financial storm. It could be a job-related storm. It could be health storm. Yes, and then it could be a storm brought about by sin. But what if God put you in their life to help them in their time of storm? I want you to think about this today. What has Jesus called you to do? What has he called you to be? Where has he called you to go? How has he called you to help? Because he's calling. The phone's ringing. Sometimes on the way, way to fulfill your calling, you will personally run into a storm. The disciples did. It seems to me that they got on the water with Jesus and a storm came up. That might be a life's lesson for for us. Storms of this world can be the result of fall of man. Which could mean that every, every storm is a part of a sin. But I believe that some of those storms come as trials from the Father. And he calls us to come to him. He calls us to go for him. He calls us as we go to face the forces of darkness. Jesus is calling. What is he calling you to? Think about your track last week. Think about your track this week. Think about the storm that you may be in and how Jesus wants to come to you. And he's calling you. He made you go this way so that you could have this experience and you could grow. Jesus calls. The second thing that I see here is Jesus cares. Excuse me, Jesus comes. I love this story and there's so many parts of it. The disciples were likely over a mile, maybe two miles from land in the middle of a storm. That meant back that way there was two miles of water. Back that way there was two miles of water. Four professional fishermen, and they were afraid because they're working. Here's what I'm going to tell you. If if they left before what was considered dark, you know, our our daylight and dark, we go from midnight to midnight. That's our days, midnight to midnight. As you know, the Jewish Hebrew time went from 6 o'clock in the evening to 6 o'clock in the evening. 6 o'clock in the evening was the first watch. That's how they had it broken up. First watch, 9 o'clock was the second watch. Midnight was the third watch. And 3 in the morning was the fourth watch. <clears throat> We're told in my translation very early in the morning, some of the other translations identified as the fourth watch. That means that Jesus came walking to them at, four, uh, excuse me, at 3 a.m. in the morning. They had been battling the storm all night. They were fatigued. They were given out because the wind was contrary. It was against them. I lived on the coast. We lived on the coast for a lot of years. I don't know if you've ever been a long way from land and had a storm come up, had bad weather come up, but I have. And it's frightening. And that was in the daylight. Why did Jesus wait? I mean, he knew. Why did he wait till 3 o'clock in the morning? Why, why when the storm came up, why didn't he get up from the, his communion with the Father and say, Father, the guys are in trouble. I got to go. Why did he wait? I don't know the reason it doesn't give it, but I'll tell you what I think, what I believe in my heart. I believe he waited until they got fatigued. Until they just got given out. And why would I say that? Because before then, they would have thought they could save themselves. But when they waited for, when he waited for them to be fatigued, they had to depend on him. It's kind of like 
I read this story. There were some swimmers. I'm trying to get it right. There were some swimmers. And one of them got in trouble. Big guy, strong guy. And this guy standing at the edge of the water, <coughs> and they said, he's in trouble. We know you can get him. He said, yeah, I'm going to wait. He goes, what? I'm going to wait. Sure enough, the guy lost all his energy and started under. And the guy dove in and saved him. When they got him back, he was okay. They said, why did you wait? He said, as long as he had energy, as long if I went out there, he'd pull both of us under. But when he was without energy, he would trust me. I wonder sometimes Jesus has to wait for us to fatigue before he comes to us. Because we'll fight him with what he needs to do. Jesus, can, can you imagine it? The disciples were fighting the storm. And Jesus comes. He shows up not like they thought he was going to come. Not where they thought he was going to come. Not when they thought he was going to come. He came walking on the water. Now, would you raise your hand if you've ever seen anybody walk on water? Oh, that's what I'm talking about. They knew, where the, they knew where the stumps were. That's the only way you can walk on water. You see, that's significant that he's walking. Actually, it says he's walking on the sea. Did you notice that translation? This is unique on all kind of levels. First, on the human side, walking on the water is, you could say it with me, impossible. Nobody walks on the water. Next, Jesus came out walking on the very thing that was threatening to take the disciples under. And he's walking above it. Now, if you know anything about the ocean, some of you, can, or some of you will come and school me more on this. But here's what I know about the ocean. You have ground swells. And then on top of the ground swells, you have the seas. Went out one time to snapper fish. When we got out there, the ground swells were about six to ten feet. And then there were three to four foot seas on top of that. It really makes a difference. Every part of it. Jesus came out walking on the seas, not on the ground swells. He was walking above the water. His ability defies everything that we know. If water walking was the norm, then disciples had nothing to worry about. Even a mile from land, they could have got out and done it themselves. He comes to them in their struggle, like he comes to us in our struggle. He comes to them in ways they didn't expect. He comes to us in ways we will never expect. Walking on the water. How many of you, can you imagine what it would have been like to be on that boat in the middle of the dark, dark night? There's no moon, there's no stars. And look out across there. I can imagine they're looking out across the horizon. They, somebody going, what is that? And so everybody's got their mind and glued and they go, I don't know. It's a ghost. And when they said that, got afraid, Jesus has identified himself. It's me. It's me. Now, my part of the story is that, not that Jesus walked on the water, but he let Peter walk on. Peter! Peter! Mr. I rebuke you, Jesus, Peter. Mr. I deny you, Jesus. He let Peter walk on the water. I submit to you that Jesus was using the storm in this situation to spring forth a new level of faith in these men. Why? It's because Jesus cares. Jesus cares. One of the great songwriters of my generation, be quiet, Eric, of my generation was John W. Peterson. 
How many of you have ever been in the choir do you remember see, hear, singing some of John W. Peterson music? Anybody? I got one over here. I got other folks that don't have good memories because we sang a lot of John W. Peterson music when I was here 45 years ago. He was the big writer at the time. Christmas musicals, Night of Miracles, Sound of Singing, King of Kings, great, great Easter musical, The Last Week. For years and years, I sang a song that tells us about Jesus. The lyrics are, he cares when you're troubled and the whole world seems wrong. He cares when the trials try to silence your song. He cares when you're lonely, though you laugh with the throng. Oh, Jesus cares. He cares when you stumble in the heat of the day. He cares when you're burdened and too weary to pray. He cares when you fail him, when your feet go astray. Jesus cares. I see this truth in this story, and it speaks to me and to us today very personally. Whatever life tosses at you, whatever life sends your way, Jesus cares, and he will respond. Jesus called them to the place in the middle of the storm. He comes to them. I love how this develops. After the shock of seeing someone walking on the water and Jesus saying, oh, don't be afraid, it's me. Peter wants a little more proof. Jesus, your words were, follow me. So if you can walk on the water, I can walk on the water. I mean, I, I mean, put this in perspective. Five minutes earlier, Peter and all the disciples were concerned about whether they were going to survive or not. They were concerned about the contrary wind. Now with Jesus on the scene, Peter forgets about the wind. He forgets about the ways and he focuses on Jesus. And Jesus had cared enough about him to come and focus on him. I used to love Grady Nutt. I love to hear Grady Nutt talk about this and I think he had it right. I think Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, bid me come to you. And he goes, okay, come on. And Peter's on the edge of the boat, got the disciples around him, and he's going, you don't believe I'll do it, do you? And then with his eyes on Jesus, he steps off the boat. And all of a sudden, he's walking on the very stuff that you're not supposed to walk on. For me, this is the peace that Jesus gives when the storms of life rage around you, with your focus on Jesus, you can walk above them. The winds, the waves, fear can't touch Peter while he's focusing on Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the storms of this life cannot touch us if we focus our attention on Jesus. That would be good. Yeah, that would have been, thank you. That would have been a good place for an amen. I'm, you know, when we learn to focus on Jesus and not on ourselves. Now look, I know that, G, that Peter began to see the strength of the winds and the waves, took his focus off Jesus, and he began to sink. And people want to really beat him over the head for that. Have you ever thought about it? How many of those disciples, how many of those disciples were water walking available to that night? Out of 12, how many? 12. They could have all taken a step. They could have all walked on the water. The rest of them stayed in the boat. And John Ortberg's got a book entitled, If You Want to Walk on the Water, You've Got to Get Out of the Boat. Peter may have gone under, but he went under, headed toward Jesus. Jesus cared enough to come and teach him some more things about faith and what Jesus could do. Peter got distracted. 
But Jesus saw his heart of commitment. Learn from Peter. When you're going under in a storm, cry out to Jesus, Lord, save me. The storm could be the storm of the sin in your life that you've created by your own by your own life, by your own committing of sin, by your own unbelief, by your own trusting other things. And just before you go under, he'll be there with his hand outstretched. And you can say, Lord, save me. Problem is, a lot of us want to wait till we're just about to be dead. I'm going to do that at the very last minute. You know people who have told me that? They didn't know about the last minute. They were one of these folks that were here in this world. Heart attack, car wreck, it doesn't matter. In an instant they were gone. They had no chance to make the decision. Have you made the decision? Jesus cares enough about you. Peter said, Lord, save me. And immediately, don't you like that? Immediately Jesus reached out his hand. And carried him into the boat. Now he lifted him up on the top of the water, Eric. He didn't drag him in the water, okay? I just want you to know that. He lifted him up and carried him in the boat. And when he got in the boat, the storm went away. That brings us to our last thought. In your life, when the storms are raging, get Jesus with you because Jesus calms he will calm the storm. He will calm the sea. He will calm the, the waves. This last verse, it says, excuse me, verse 32, it says, When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those in the boat worshipped him. Two and a half years, I've, been, I've, wanted to, I've done my best as your pastor to communicate this to you. They didn't have hymn books. They didn't have technology. They didn't have instruments. They didn't have anything that we normally equate with worship. And they worshiped him. And their message was truly, truly, you are the Son of God. Could it be that all we need to do today is get Jesus in our boat. If we let him in, he may put the storm under our feet. He may put the sea under our feet. He may put it all under our feet and calm what's going on. Because you see, folks, if I asked here in this room who has gone through storms and struggles in your life, any honest person would raise their hand. And here's what I'll tell you. Through all that you've been through, through all that you've been through, Jesus is there with that hand extended. Fifty years ago, Andre Crouch burst onto the scene. Worship leader, songwriter. I think we have some of his songs in our hymnal today. I hated it when he passed away. For those who don't know Andre, he was an African-American guy that just loved God with all his heart. Wrote about the blood of Jesus, wrote about life. Here's some of his lyrics. I've had many tears and problems. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong. But in every situation, God gave his blessed consolation that my trials only come to make me strong. I've been a lot of places and I've seen a lot of faces and there have been times I felt so all alone. But in those lonely hours, those precious lonely hours, Jesus let me know I was his own. And the course is through it all. I've learned to trust in Jesus 
and I've learned to trust in God. These guys were on a journey with Jesus. They were being faithful to his call. And he called them to a higher level of faith. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter what you've been through in your life, Jesus will be your answer if you'll let him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing to us that you're here for us. That you sent your only son, Jesus, to offer us hope, help, life, and light. I pray for every person in this room, if there's someone that doesn't know Jesus, might today be the day that they invite him into their life. May now be the time that you give them a, a fresh start. If someone has invited Jesus into their life and, and they've kind of elbowed him out, I pray that today will be a, a renewal time. Speak to our hearts. Speak so we can hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Just a moment, we're going to stand and sing the nail-scarred hand. It's those nail-scarred hands that bought our salvation. If you've never trusted Christ and would like to today, Brother Kevin's going to be over here. I'll be over here. We'll be glad to talk and pray with you. You can just make your way whatever aisle's closest to you. People will let you out. If you want to pray, you can make this an altar and come pray. We'll be glad to pray with you. If you're interested in church membership, come see one of us and we'll have that process start. Whatever your decision, don't delay. Come on the first word of the song. Let's stand, let's sing, and you come. Have you failed in your plan of your storm tossed side? Place your hand in the One more verse. This is for you. You come. Are you walking alone through the shadows? Father, thank you for how you love us and watch over us. Thank you that we can place our hand in your hand and you will lead us home.